Um, it's kind of an interesting presentation because it covers a lot of ground. Um, it's a little bit shallow, uh, but I hope you guys will um, track us down during whatever the rest of the conference and stuff if you have any specific questions or anything. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, Drupal, and we're going to be talking about uh, OpenU, and we're going to be talking about um, really how we uh, integrated it with sort of some third-party kind of custom-developed solutions. Um, a little bit about us, um, Jeremiah and Allie, we are Advantage Labs. We used to be a company of that was larger and smaller, and in the last three or four years, we ended up being a very small company, just the two of us. And we uh, are really happy being a small company, partly because, you know, we don't have to compete on big projects, we don't have to work on major workflows. What we end up doing is working with um, generally larger problems, or projects with interesting questions to answer. And so we help with custom migrations, or we help with upgrades, or we help with custom implementation, or adding a very unique, bizarre module to something, or something like that. So we end up getting to do like a really narrow piece of larger projects, and that's made us um, that's made us pretty happy. Uh, we collaborate with people who really like to answer interesting questions, which is we we also like to do. So we also are really active in our local open source Drupal community. We've got a really solid community in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, Twin I forgot the other city. You always do. St. Paul. <laughs> Minneapolis and St. Paul in Minnesota. Uh, we have a really active Drupal camp. We have a really active um, Drupal community within our local university. And so uh, just about a year and a half ago, we were hanging out at our local uh, Twin Cities Drupal camp, and somebody else came to us uh, who also likes to ask, ask interesting questions. Um, they are the Center for Research and Education and Simulation Technologies, um, aka CREST. They've been working on a variety of simulation technologies and have been in investigating different learning management systems. And they had an interesting question as well. Um, they wanted to know how can we use technology to make medical training better. <clears throat> they had been, it's pretty unethical or at least uncomfortable to do medical testing or training or learning procedures on live human subjects. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, most medical students at some point in their, their career um, practice on cadavers. There's some scarcity there and they don't offer a whole lot of feedback. Um, and so there's been kind of a, an industry associated with uh, developing medical uh, simulation. So if you've ever uh, taken a CPR class, you may recognize Rusasiani. Um, it's a great to be able to practice procedures on a device that can feel no pain. Simulation is the same for everyone, which means you can use it in a predictable environment. Everyone who's ever done a CPR class has used the same dummy in the same way, um, having the same tests and, you know, and the same kind of results. And it's good to, to have something that consistent and that repeatable so that you can um, really measure progress against people or, or develop um, uh, best practices across a whole body of education. So it's good to have a repeatable, reusable simulation device that you can't really hurt uh, and that, that, uh, that everybody's going to be able to make use of. So there's a huge industry, and honestly, we kind of were surprised by what we, were, <laughs> we found um, when we were looking around. There's just some major industries like of, of anything you could possibly imagine of um, simulators, sensors, tests, uh, dummies, bodies, parts, bones, <laughs> um, tissues, just whatever you could possibly imagine. There's you, Somebody's thought of it. And again, it, it allows you to have a repeatable environment where you can you know, execute these kinds of tests without actually harming anything, um, and uh, and then to, to develop your skills. And uh, what DrupalCon presentation is complete without a cat picture. So, um, <laughs> so for the most part, these tools have been a big help, um, but there's still an important question to answer. And the question is, how do you know you're not doing it wrong? Um, you could be Doing this, you could you could be killing Rasasiani every single time. You wouldn't necessarily know it. Um, you could <laughs> uh, take one of these devices and you could you know misexecute a procedure and you wouldn't you know be able to get any feedback about it. Um, and so 
you need to start gathering objective assessments. And so a lot of these devices end up having sensors, um, buzzers, alarms, things like that, that uh, tell you when you're doing it wrong, tell you when you're doing it right, uh, measure performance, measure, you know, depth, accuracy, placement, you know, any type of sensors, objective assessments of, of whether or not it's being done correctly. Um, or subjective assessment. You could do all the objective assessing in the world and you wouldn't actually, you know, be able to <clears throat> know that you're doing it right unless somebody who knows what they're doing can look over your shoulder and be like, yeah, that, that was right, that was wrong, you should try it this way, have you ever thought of this? And this is how best practices are developed. And so you need some kind of human being interaction to, to validate that you're doing stuff right. Um, and then once you're actually assessing and doing things, you need to be able to, to store data. Like, how is one person doing? Are they, are they improving or not improving? How is a whole group of people improving? What does the bell curve look like? Um, who's, <clears throat> who's doing well? Who's doing poorly? And how, how can we, again, develop best practices to educate people better and more consistently? So objective cons assessments are you know, they work consistently, they provide feedback, the results are measurable. Uh, if you play the game operation, um, you know that if you do it wrong, you're gonna get a buzzer. Like you're gonna you use the tweezers to pick out the, you know, water on the knee and it, uh, you hit the side of it and a buzzer goes off and you did it wrong and you know it. And so you, you may, next time you do it, you're gonna be trying really hard not to, to hit the side of that that uh, sensor. Right. <laughs> you can be uh, limited to objective assessments. You can't be limited to objective assessments, though, because, um, again, like, you could pick up uh, the game operation and turn it upside down and shake it, and you could, you know, successfully get all the pieces out of it without actually triggering the buzzer once. Um, or you could use a tool that is the incorrect tool and not, not the tweezers with the, the cable attached to it, and you would be able to get all the pieces out without uh, uh, triggering the sensors, right? And so, and it's not just malice. It's not like people are just trying to game the system. I mean, if you have an incision that you're trying to learn how to, to find a vein, it's like you need to um, be able to know, like, have somebody look over your shoulder and say, could you try it this way or go, you know, at, at this other angle or otherwise... Uh, figure out how to learn it better. Um, so it's important to have subjective assessment or instructor vetting. Someone who's properly trained to can view the procedure, grade it, offer feedback, tell you how you can improve, make sure that people are improving, and just generally be available for instruction and learning, knowledge transfer. And so we've had instructors forever, like longer than we've had any kind of simulator at all. Um, we've been having more and more devices have... Uh, sensors and equipment and buzzers and, you know, that that technology is improving well. But storing these assessments is actually kind of a new horizon. Um, and it's kind of important because you kind of need to build this body of history. So you need some kind of mm, system to manage this content. Content management system, perhaps? Um, I'm sure you're not surprised that we're using Drupal for this. Uh, the people that were working with the university had actually looked at uh, a number of other solutions before they even came to us. They had a Moodle implementation. They had a, a proprietary learning management system that they built. Um, neither of these solutions were flexible enough. They couldn't get what they needed out of it. Um, Drupal um, stores data consistently, sort of. Um, it's highly customizable, so, you know, obviously you, you can get X percentage of the way there, let's say 80%, 90%, and then you can build what you need to to, to bring your project home. Um, for this particular project, using things like services to create REST APIs, things like that, being able to consistently like draw a line between what belongs to sensor data and what belongs to, to Drupal um, with a clean API, <coughs> being able to build that efficiently and be able to change that efficiently was a big deal. And uh, the broad community of wonderful people. I mean, we're really pretty happy to. I mean, I've, I've been part of Drupal for a long time. I was at the first conference in Antwerp. Um, and uh, it's nice to know that you can reach out and find somebody to help you or find somebody with common interests or common goals. So 
they came to us because you know we knew about Drupal and they knew about about the stuff that they were working on, um, and they actually introduced us to a uh, distribution um, called Opinio. Um, it's a learning management system. Uh, doesn't uh, the functionality that you need for classes and content and quizzes and passing and failing and all that stuff and group curriculum? You could. Imagine how you might build something with organic groups and and, and other and other tools, uh, but that would take a lot of work. And so, thankfully, there is a learning management distribution that has done that work for you. Um, it uh, it does exactly you know has security has groups it has uh, courses students group are grouped by course lessons go into to those courses and you can and gather assessments and store knowledge. So really everything that you actually want uh, to store from this, this technology is there, except for the, the bridge between that technology and the, the content. So <clears throat> um, a couple built-in things with Opinio. Um, you've got sort of courses, and so a medical student has logged in and this is some courses that they're uh, participating in. Um, and those courses group um, lessons. It's really hard to see in there. But, um, but there's individual lessons where you can have different slides of content, different curriculum videos, um, really pretty much any type of multimedia you want. I'm actually really impressed with the, the robust nature of that content um, management. And uh, inside of an individual lesson, you can put any type of content you want. Um, these nice little, like, back forth start lesson edit. It keeps track of where you're at. It keeps track of how you're doing. Uh, keeps track of versioning so that you can, you know, change the, the lesson content and people are actually pinned <coughs> to a specific version of, of what they're learning so you don't have results change as the, the uh, underlying uh, version changes. Um, it's actually a surprisingly solid system for that kind of stuff. You know, this content that we have is not all that oh, all that um, exciting, uh, but um, but it's a good way to just store chunks of information and page through it and keep track of it. I mean, I've I've been happy with that. Um, it's also got built in like. Quizzes, you know, subject matter assessment. You can assess knowledge using a variety of multiple choice or other question types. Um, <clears throat> it's a good way to provide uh, content review, knowledge review on, on the information that's been presented. That stuff's pretty, pretty helpful. Um, the university had developed these devices and they wanted objective test results from their learning machines to appear as objective results in the system. So, I mean, as opposed to a yes or no question, do you understand the content? You can't ask that, but you can say, did you kill that guy? <laughs> right? And, um, and be able to get a yes, no answer. And so that's really the, the, the name of the game for us was to be able to answer that question. Did you kill that guy? Um, or whatever other type of, of, meta, of assessment that we could do from that. Um, this guy, Dr. Jonathan Brayman at uh, Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Minnesota has been working with these kind of devices. He's been providing a lot of feedback and participation on developing these particular boxes. And uh, how do you like, oh, no, oh, where's your sound? the sound is in there. Did our tech go away? Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of buttons. <laughs> um, I don't know how to make it stop either. No, I'm just going back and back and back. Keep going. All right, it's this slide. And it's okay. not going. I'm tempted to just um, yank the. <laughs> How do I get back to my desktop? Wait. 
What are you doing? I'm checking the sound settings. It's trying to go out through the HDMI. simulator project is to um, try to make sure that um, orthopedic surgeons in training who are learning how to do small joint minimally invasive surgery have the skills that they need to move from to move safely from the untrained environment into working in the operating room on real patients. In the past there were no great tools for teaching some of the skills and they're very different from the skills that we learn in open surgery. And consequently, we developed these two um, simulators, one to teach the goal of visualizing something in space and triangulating with a, with a tool to press on different spaces. The second skill was to manipulate objects in space, again using the arthroscope or a small joint camera, uh, to move things around, practicing in both of these environments by manual or both handedness using the camera in both the left and the right hand and then manipulating things with the opposite hand. The combination of those skills sets the foundation for moving forward and learning more complex uh, knee, shoulder, ankle, elbow, and wrist arthroscopy techniques um, and enables us as surgical educators to teach the trainees the things that can only be learned in the operating room on real patients well, they've, because they've learned things that can be learned outside of the operating room using these simulators. Okay, so I mean there's a variety of different types of applications of simulators and this one in fact was skill building and uh, I know you've tried to use this and it's just <laughs> it's not all that fun to watch. It's really hard actually. <laughs> <laughs> it is actually a skill that you have to build. Um, and so I mean we wanted people to be able to work on these devices and be able to get information about how it went um, and track that data within the same system where we're providing the content and courses and, and assessments of other data that's, you know, subject matter review. And so this is the output of a particular test uh, or a particular exercise um, that, that one of us ran. Um, and uh, what, what, can you explain the chart? Yeah, so on this particular display, which we added, we're just showing um, the overall result over time. So you can track how a student's improved or, or not as they've gone through the exercise multiple times, which is one of the things that they really wanted to be able to track for these studies and, and uh, watching how their trainees are improving um, through the use of these tools. Um, and we have other displays for when you're looking at an individual result where you can see uh, timeline of information about different uh, things that occurred during the the assessment, um, different sensors that were triggered, or or uh, how long it took them to perform the procedure. The first exercise is this triangulation. Is actually running the triangulation exercise is designed well. to teach the user to move around inside the uh, simulator and manually press on objects using the left and the right hands. It requires a couple of attempts to switch the camera to the left hand and back to the right, as well as the probe uh, in the opposite hand. This, this begins with the scope box properly attached to the monitor and the LMS activated, and it begins with both the scope and the probe in the registers on the side of the box. It will begin by uh, placing the scope in one hand and the probe in the other and identifying which of the target lights is on. In this instance, the target light is nearest to the front of the box and on the left-hand side. And consequently, that probe, the target can only be hit by moving the scope to the right hand and the probe to the left. Once that target is depressed, the next light will light up, allowing the probe to move forward and identify where the targets are at. It may be worthwhile to do this exercise in a darkened room um, in order to facilitate visualization inside the box. Now this next target is on the top of the box but on the right hand side of the box and consequently can only be hit with the scope in the left hand and the probe in the right. And then moving forward in the back and now identifying where the next target is in the front of the box again switching
the probe to the left hand so that I can reach this target on the floor of the simulator right there and right there there it is there and that's on the other side so switching back to put the probe in the right hand so that I can reliably probe that and then moving to the last target. Once the last target is hit, the LMS will notify you, and you can end the simulator by placing the probe back in the registers and also the scope back in these as well. You got to see one of our other colleagues in the background during that video. <laughs> So in addition to capturing those results, right, so like this is where, this is that, yeah, so this is where they were hitting the targets, at, um, right, and mm -hmm. um, in addition to storing those objective test results, so, did, uh, oh, God. Go forward again. No. Oh. the HDMI. It's very touchy. There we go. Okay. Um, Another thing that was happening is um, <laughs> can also record video during the event, uh, during the, the training event, and um, match those videos with those, those results and allow an instructor to come along later and watch the videos and, you know, make those subjective assessments. And so this is actually a different project, which is why it's asking kind of off-the-wall questions, uh, you know, about head placement. Um, but... Um, we're able to we create questions that are subjective in nature and allow instructors um, to revisit uh, the student test results and add additional information and, and have their, their scores factor into the overall results of, of the student. So now we have objective, you know, assessment of like, you know, sensor sensed and sent in information and timed it and, and did whatever metrics that we needed to do uh, for to, to validate that lesson. We also now have subjective assessments of instructors being able to sit down and watch and, and decide whether or not students did a good job. Um, and it's, it's a time saver, right, because they don't have to sit down and participate it with each and every student. If there's multiple runs and, like, the whole bunch of objectively failed, you know, the instructor doesn't necessarily have to sit down and watch every single one of them. So it's a, a really big time saver uh, to be able to manage it this way and have it all in one place um, as well as, as just having the, just the raw technology available. And, uh, and one of the things they – that uh, – Dr. Brayman wants to be able to do with these boxes is actually send sets home with medical students. So they not only can come in and perform the tasks um, in a classroom environment and try to get training that way, but they can take them home and practice and, and try to develop their skills, their dexterity with switching instruments and scopes and, and whatnot um, on their own time and then come back for final assessment before they move on to working with cadavers and then going at the actual OR. So yeah, so you know we have it all kind of going on in one. Oh my God, did you do that? <laughs> Maybe. How did that even happen? That. Okay. No. <laughs> nope. I don't think the tape's helping. There you go. Okay. Nobody touch anything. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, so it's all in one place. It's all, you know, like every student has like a, a good history associated with them. And in fact, the orthopedics department at the U of M will be launching a study using these simulator boxes uh, probably uh, this fall for sure. Um, and so they'll be able to kind of really test it in a real world environment as well. So getting to just the sort of overall nuts and bolts of it all, how do we get this information from these sensors, devices, you know, into into a data uh, Drupal. Um, I guess I'll let you talk about some of that stuff. Yeah. Are we trading? Sure. Okay. So this just kind of highlights the overall workflow between everything. So this this slide is actually talking about uh, the airway trainer, but the the uh, workflow is the same for these these trainers as well. 
um, the airway trainer was for learning how to do intubations. Um, so you have the trainer itself that has sensors built in. It's got an Arduino at its core that's reading the sensor data and has libraries on it uh, to communicate back over USB with a uh, Google Chrome plugin uh, that's running on the student's laptop. And that's sort of our, our gateway between the hardware world and the LMS. So on the LMS side, we've got Opinio maintaining all of our curriculum um, and with the integration for, for this stuff. Um, and we also have a Corento media server, in theory. <laughs> It's still kind of a work in progress um, for, as a video store for the WebRTC video. So when the student's performing the task, um, any video from the scope or from other camera sources, depending on the test, will go be streamed from the plugin back to the media server, and those records will get associated with the student's result in the LMS. Um, and those. So we communicate through with the plugin over over REST, um, and it communicates back with us over REST API provided by services, and then it's providing the gateway through uh, USB HID to the actual hardware. So the workflow as a student when you're coming into the, the system, um, you log in, you go to your course, um, you go through all your other curriculum material describing the exercises, answer whatever questions. There might be pre-tests or other things that are a more traditional test format. And then you get to the point of doing the exercise where you've got the boxes on the table and you're ready to, ready to go. So you click Start Lesson. Um, and at this point, we're intercepting that click uh, with a little bit of JavaScript that will launch the Chrome plugin and sort of give it uh, information about the REST endpoint for the LMS. Um, the app, the Chrome app, then comes back and hits the API and gets some additional configuration information that the faculty person has, has entered for the parameters on how they want the, the assessment to occur. How long should it take at maximum? Um, how, how long of a touch can you have on a sensor before it registers an error state? That kind of information. Um, so then the student performs the assessment they go through, they, they poke the little lights off or, or whatnot, they trigger some errors, they hopefully don't kill the patient. Um, and when they complete, the plugin sends the video, as I said, back over WebRTC to the media server. It sends a REST request back to, to the LMS, to Drupal, um, with a payload of, of the raw data of the exercise, all of the error states that occurred, and some other stuff that we're capturing that more discreetly, like, what, what was the start time? How long did it take? Um, did they succeed or fail? So that, ac that actual success value gets determined by the trainer itself and gets sent back to Drupal. Um, sort of really the arbiter of business rules. Yeah, yeah. So all the business logic about did they kill the patient or not lives on the trainer, and it makes that determination based on all of the live data. Um, and then we store everything against the student record so that as we said before, you can sort of track an individual's performance uh, as they go through and, and use these tools. So <clears throat> from a nuts and bolts thing, stuff that we did, uh, we extended the quiz module, which is part of the opinion distribution, um, to add some additional question types. That's how it interacts with, with uh, making it so that you have data. <laughs> um, so rather than just having a question type that's multiple choice, we have a question that is a simulator result. Um, so we have somewhere to store our data against. Uh, we've got another question type for the instructor assessments that you saw before. It's sort of a rubric grading system. And rather than the student answering the question and having that affect their score, the instructor can come back and review the results through watching the video. Um, in assessing other data that's provided and answer the questions as, as to what, how the student did and where they might have room for improvement. Um, as, as we mentioned, we're using the services module to provide the REST API so that we can hook, talk back and forth with the Chrome app. Um, we've got a custom entity type uh, that we've set up that we're using to store the configurations for the devices. Um, so when 
you get a set of these boxes or a new new trainer is developed, there'd be a, a package that you'd upload to the LMS that would contain a YAML file with configuration data, um, some CSS assets, HTML and JavaScript assets uh, that then when a uh, session is, is instantiated, we the, the trainer grabs that information, the Chrome plugin grabs that information to kind of build the UI out a little bit more. Um, and so all that's stored in its own entity type so that it can be referenced to these questions and updated later on. So fundamentally, I mean, so much of the, you touched a thing. Oh. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> uh, but anyway, like the the surprising thing about this is that how little we actually had to do. I mean, it sounds like a lot, but I mean, um, implementing an entity type and installing the services module and extending modules that were already there was actual work, but it was not nearly the same undertaking as developing a learning management system or storing data or you know anything like that. So <clears throat> it ended up being a, a good fit for for Drupal, surprisingly surprisingly well. Okay, and now we can do a demo. Rather than fumble around inside these boxes, which if anyone wants to after, or if we do a boff or something later in the week, <laughs> you can, you're welcome to try. Uh, they're fun to use, but they can be a little intimidating. So we've actually got another device that they uh, set up for us. <laughs> you may recognize it from earlier on. Hopefully I don't screw up the the laptop by plugging this in. And we just need to... So they hacked a game of operation for us. So let's see here. So we've logged into the LMS as a medical student. We're in the operation, operation course and lesson. Oh, of course there's not. Um, Can you switch back to Yeah, that? I get to see it. <laughs> that didn't do what I wanted. No, because I moved it over there. Just... There we go. All right. <laughs> so we're in Opinion right now. This is a <clears throat> demo site that we've got set up. And we're logged in as a medical student. Um, we're in our lesson and we're ready to go. So we can go ahead and click start. It's gonna launch the Chrome plugin. Wonderful UI, still have a little <laughs> bit of work to do on some of the CSS. <laughs> and we can tell it we're ready to go. And so now we can go in and see how we do. Oh, did it not trigger? There we go. One error. Oh, that's not. This worked right before. That's a curse of live demonstrations at a conference. <laughs> terrible doctor. Yeah, well, let's see here. We're just going to start over. <laughs> All 
Rainy. <laughs> You're not going to work, are you? <laughs> oh, there it went off. All right, there we go. Got that one. So it's throwing some little blue lights on the screen to let you know which one to do next. And it's got some Hall effect sensors. There's little magnets that glued to these pieces to know when you've actually... Got, got it out of there. And we're done. We're done. Scored zero percent. Awesome. <laughs> Did you kill that guy? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so once you perform that, it, it closes out, and you can go in and take a look at the results. So there's some testing in here from our, our colleague, and then here's our result from the last one we just did. And it's logging it. It's got uh, graphing some of the errors that occurred. And we can go back. I had a little bit better performance right before the presentation. I got 70%. <laughs> so. <laughs> Let's go back here. All right. So I guess we're supposed to tell you to evaluate the session. Um, and, and we're, uh, I guess, just go to uh, just the whole schedule, the generic schedule URL. And also uh, join us for the contribution sprints on Friday. Um, in terms of just this presentation, if you have any questions, comments, interest, uh, especially, especially if you guys are visiting here because you're doing something similar or interesting, I'd really like to hear about it. Anyone have any questions? Um, I, I think you're... Yeah, they want us, like want us to try to use the... Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, we'll repeat it. Uh, you store all this data into Drupal. Um, of course, there, there, there will be some kind of uh, well boundaries to, to which extent of content you can go, to, to how many data you can store. Is that something you are managing some way? Or uh, just um, it's all just um, uh, solved by by using the media server. Um, oh, as far as the video access. <clears throat> well, I mean, uh, it's fortunately because you're kind of confined by a group of students for a particular class or something like that. We we've thus far been able to. I mean, we're planning on just using the media server, and um, we can understand which files came from which class and archive them accordingly as time goes by. Uh, the actual sensor data we're storing uh, just in JSON and it's not that. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, as we said before, most of the business rule logic is happening on the trainer itself. And so we don't get a whole lot of data back from it besides mostly what you saw up there. Yeah, there's some bits and pieces we pull out, like the score and the timestamp information and things like that. And then the software is really used by, by classes or, or some classes and not the whole. Uh, yeah, we don't like get the raw feed of all. Yeah, yeah, no, precisely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In the in these cases, um, for these devices, the LMS isn't necessarily something they're instituting across the entire university for everything. It's more uh, to store curriculum and information as it relates just to like the or orthopedic students so students going through that particular program and then there might be if there um, become other programs and other trainers and they might have their own instance or perhaps combine them but at least with these devices we're talking about um, for the most part individual institutions will that are interested in using them for their students will buy a few 
sets of the devices and they'll get a subscription to the LMS and then they can come in and, and uh, have their own data. Um, while there is a fair amount of video, as Ellie said, we don't necessarily need to keep all of it. We're keeping, um, we'll keep video around for a sort of whatever makes sense, uh, the last three attempts, the last 10 attempts. And the upshot is, of course, using using Drupal um, for something that's this niche is that if it did get broadly instituted somehow and you have scalability questions, that's a question that's been very very handily addressed in a number of ways throughout the Drupal community. So, yeah. Is there any way of seeing either the raw data that comes through in JSON, or even just looking at it as a single node ever so much that has some of the information, but just maybe getting more of the structure? It's not pretty. <laughs> Can you, I think you just have to edit the database. Yeah, I mean, I could probably log in and show you the database. Um, the, uh, the most of the uh, extra data that we're storing is a timestamp with some metadata about what the error state was, and that's about it. So, um, yeah, and I guess part of that is, you know, we, we developed with with our partner like exactly what we get back, so it could be anything. Um, what we get in this JSON payload, um, but most of that business world, like what develops that JSON, is not. It's it's kind of out, out of our our jurisdiction. So like yeah, the actual, the hmm? yes, yeah, exactly. There, the the Chrome app I think actually is is processing that information. Um, so. What we get back could be anything as dictated by that that sort of intermediate app. Um, and what, as Jeremiah was saying, what we do get back is not all that comprehensive. Really, you're just going to shell out there. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> and so, so that's also something that, you know, right now we are just storing um, the data pretty much raw. And then um, one of the slightly down the road things that we want to do is define some other objects or entity types for defining, con defining some of the data structure so that uh, we can come up with a common language between the devices and the LMS so that we can do a little bit more with the data we're storing. Right now, um, to like put some of the graph data on the screen or or things like that, we're just kind of iterating over whatever was provided and creating some custom displays. We don't have a lot of integration into something like views right now, so you could generate your own reports. But yeah, but exactly defining that common language, I think, is something that will be useful for, for all of that. Yeah. I find it very interesting, the type of way that you work, and uh, questioning that line is, uh, is this where you usually work in? data that is online uh, with physical objects and stuff like that and what's your experience with this if, if you think this is expanding is, is, is this becoming a bit more popular to you and, and how do you approach those type of questions I don't think it's that common no, I don't think it's that common right now. So, uh, question is if we have, we do this a lot, uh, work with with this type of hardware integration, um, and if it's growing. And I, we this is kind of a new project for us. Like I said, we like to take on interesting projects, people asking interesting questions, and that one definitely qualifies. Um, and I, I think that there's more and and more interesting applications for. It. I mean, I know that we are we're kind of talking about like setting up hardware sensors for our garden, right? And building them into a Drupal instance to tell us when to, to water our, our flower beds or things like that. There's any number of, you know, all kinds of new sensors for all kinds of different reasons. There's all kinds of like walled gardens of proprietary systems that are interacting with that, that hardware data um, that I think would be more interesting if you could get that data inter to interact with something like Drupal, so. Um, yeah. It's it, yeah, some um, uh, custom code. One of our other colleagues who's working more on the hardware side uh, wrote that.
saying, you know, like uh, some people who are so obviously people will use it for everything. Mm -hmm. And then uh, people get surprised, like, why didn't you choose this one or that one? <laughs> did you, or did you consider anything else? Like this? Um, well, we are Drupal specialists. Uh, so, and they contacted <laughs> us because... Because, you know, we work with Drupal. But they actually came by way of other other tools that did not work well for them. So they tried Moodle, for example, um, which has a lot of the learning management courseware curriculum, subject matter assessment, um, knowledge assessments, et cetera. Um, and it didn't work for them because it wasn't flexible, like sensible enough. Um, they tried, I think there is some instance of, of a proprietary, like a learning management system that they tried to write from the ground up. and these questions that come up, how do you interact with new hardware? How do you, how do you scale in case it gets big? Like, how do you interact with users, and, you know, and all these other questions that the Drupal community at large has managed to answer. Um, and I think I've, you know, I've been working with Drupal for a lot of years now. Um, I don't know, 12 years. Um, and uh, I've kind of gone through my, my series of Drupal has to be used for all the things all the time, always. And now I'm kind of a little bit, I'm a little more mature. <laughs> and, and I do have a more realistic sense of, of places where it is not a good fit. Um, and a project like this, I think, is definitely, it is a good fit for all of the reasons. Um, you know, it's easy to implement APIs. It's easy to, to manage and track data. Um, it's easy to throw together um, media management stuff for, for developing curriculum. So I think this is, in, in particular, a good fit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's the uh, last result. Can you just I can try. command plus or something? Is that working by word? Oh, that's, oh, that's by word? Yeah, the <laughs> terminal session wasn't looking so good. You just go back to your terminal and resize that. Yeah. <coughs> <Ugh>. <laughs> That's as big, big as I can get it, I'm afraid. If you'd like to see it, you're welcome to come up and I can show you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that last... Is there, can you tell, is there any kind of key things in it? Or, oh. You know, duration time stamp. What's the dog? <laughs> That's one of the things inside the operation guy. <laughs> so this particular result was from our, He's got dogs our demo. Bark. Got, my dogs are barking. Oh, so... Yeah, so right, yeah. Yes, yes, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so there's just like... This, this stuff has uh, information to map back to the, the question results for the quiz module. Um, uh, trainer idea doesn't look like we're populating for this, this guy, but that would have information on which of these boxes or other trainer was, was used. Start time, elapsed time, uh, su success value, the score basically and whether or not it's been closed. And then the session data is just a blob of whatever error states occurred. Um, They're mainly all timestamps. Yeah, mostly all timestamps. So there's some more device information. This is basically the raw data that we also got some of this stuff out of. And then there's timestamps with the uh, sensor that was triggered in this case um, and when it was triggered. And, and then there's a total count into errors. separate fields? Or like, does that blob go in as one field or is it separated out into individual fields within an entity? This we end up parsing out um, on the results display. Yeah. So it's, it's more to provide a, an overview of, of the session for an um, instructor to assess. Mm -hmm. um, but not something that we're really, like I said, we're not, we don't really have a good way yet to, we don't have a fully defined language to speak. And so as the project continues and more, more trainers get developed, this same group is also working on a project for a, a full-body mannequin, a modular mannequin. So 
different heads and legs and torsos and, and, and components that can be assembled together to, um, for instance, recreate uh, uh, field trauma scenarios for uh, army doctors. So they can, have, they can configure the patient to have different things that are happening across the different modules that they have to address. So they nearly have a different target image chip then in each of the limbs then? Or yeah, components mm -hmm. and different sensors for, for, for different procedures. So increasingly, like, having this common language between them, like, how to interpret those results will become increasingly important as projects yeah, like that evolve. Yeah, visualize between everything in the classroom, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Right now, our entity type is, is, is pretty fixed. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't, like, update it. You know, we don't, don't update a particular entity um, very often, if ever. Um, that just has the information about, you know... Um, no, actually not even, just the information about the, the device itself. Um, and so it has like a little asset file to have JavaScript and stuff like that to tell how to launch the, the Chrome application. Um, the actual results and stuff um, are, are matched with um, these uh, question results. Yeah. So the, the devices themselves are kind of like, meh, I don't know. So the information that gets uploaded um, to our, our custom entity type is for configuring the devices um, contains some of, of these types of things. So the time taken to complete the operation, a maximum and minimum value, um, the number of, of touch errors that are allowed to happen um, before you consider it a failure, uh, the number of milliseconds of a of a touch before it's considered an error state. So you can kind of like graze the, the sensor wall, but if you really jab it, then we're gonna count that. And we can handle some other just general device configuration too. In this case, um, this is for the, the uh, box that you saw in the video where you're turning the lights on and off and you can configure the sequence you want them to light so that you have a consistent experience across multiple students. And so that you don't forget to cross over. You can yeah. Parrot, parrot the right time. Yeah. And this particular configuration uh, was set up for uh, a big meeting of, of all of the uh, uh, orthopedic surgery board. And they wanted to evaluate some different trainer devices. And he actually set it up a little bit advanced, they were switching their hands almost oh, every yeah. single. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of difficult, but. And is that, sorry, is that the bottom of that entity? Yeah, that's yeah. mostly, so there's a different, different sequence of targets and then so save. Yeah. Yeah, so I think there's been some discussion about having the ability to randomly generate the sequence. Um, they do want it to be maintain cons consistency, though, because, uh, for example, when they enter into a study uh, in the next couple of months, they want student A's experience to more or less be the same as student B's. So they may set up different scenarios under different lessons, but. Yeah, I don't think they want it to drastically change difficulty from one student to the next because it'll be harder to compare the result. Do you think it's a somehow? Well, we will keep the patches up to date. <laughs> I don't uh, think there is there's Be a different student, or yeah, you know. I think uh, we either have or are implementing more like authentication and some maybe some open ID stuff to keep that session more consistent. That would be a trick. <laughs> you get a different kind of of, of pass fail on that one. <laughs> and I mean, 
so the the general way that these will be used, as I mentioned earlier, in, in some instance, instances the students will take them home and they'll they'll be able to play with them on their own. In which case, they can pick the box up and look through the hole to poke the light instead of using the scope. Um, there's easier ways to cheat than <laughs> than hacking the actual interface. But when they actually come to uh, a part of their assessment where they're it's going to affect their score, their ability to move forward. Um, they're going to be evaluated. It's going to be in a, a learning environment with an instructor watching them perform the task. So there's not going to be a lot of opportunity for that to occur. Um, and otherwise, I mean, these, these students are just really there. The, the purpose of these devices isn't really necessarily to completely teach them how to perform uh, surgery on a knee, but to teach them sort of the manual skills of of being able to use the scope to see in three-dimensional space where you can't actually see um, and manipulate different devices or uh, the other the other box we didn't show is sort of a cross between operation and I don't know <laughs> but it's the the task in that box is there are uh, rows of sensors with caps over them and you have to move the cap from the sensor to a staging area and then switch your hands and then move it back to another sensor and then move it back down to the staging and move it back to its orig original position. So you're not just looking around, but you're manipulating objects and moving them around with, with the pincers and stuff. I don't know if that completely answers your question, but there is some security built in too. I mean, all the students have to log in. Um, I'm not, I don't recall exactly what we're doing inside of any REST requests for like additional um, identification beyond just IDs of, of the session, but. Right, yeah. precisely, yeah. You still have that subjective assessment as well, so. Um, we could. Yeah, we were thinking of it. We haven't scheduled one yet. If there's interest, we can definitely set one up. Yeah, okay. We have about two minutes left. You guys have any other questions? If not, you can go make wonderful use of two minutes. <laughs> and if you want to come up and take a look at the actual devices or not, please feel free. Thank you. Thanks.